Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We're going to study in this lesson a very important event. And when you rightly understand the significance of this event, it is going to speak boldly and clearly concerning the identity of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth. And it is vital, it is a requirement to know Him. And when I say know Him, that includes a right understanding of His identity, that He is the only Son of God, that He is divine. And unfortunately, many people say, oh, they believe in Jesus they think that he is uh, the savior, that they love him. But the problem is they deny biblical truth concerning his identity. So this passage makes clear who he is. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 17. The book of Matthew and chapter 17. In this section, it begins in a most interesting way. We read in verse 1, and after six days. Now think about that statement, after six days. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us that it didn't happen before six days, and it didn't happen on the six days. It had to take place after. But how much after? We don't know. Now, in another gospel, we're told that it's on the eighth day. Certainly, the eighth day is after six. So why here this confusion after six days? And the answer is this. This is one of the methodologies that the writers of Scripture use to give us a proper context for understanding this event. Because biblically, the number six, not five, but rather the number six, speaks of the grace of God. And what the author is telling us is this. It is only as an outcome of God's grace that you can arrive at a proper understanding of Messiah's identity. The entire verse, verse one. And after six days, Yeshua... He brought alongside, he took to himself, in other words, Peter, and in Hebrew, the word is Yaakov, and also in Greek, but in English, we usually translate that name James and his brother John. So Messiah brings alongside of himself three individuals, Peter, James, and John. Why three? Well, three is for the purpose of revealing, and also, according to the Torah, it is by two or three witnesses that a matter is confirmed, it is substantiated. And this is to tell us that this event, it is real, it is true. It's not some uh, uh, legend, it's not a myth, it is factual. So, once more. Yeshua, after these six days, he, he took Peter, Yaakov, and John, his brother, and he brings them up onto a high mountain by themselves. Now, here's what, what bothers me. So frequently, when, when we study a scripture like this, will get information on a high mountain. And the first thing that people want to know is this. What mountain is it? We're not told. People, for some reason, love to speculate. They make all type of assumptions. And they say, well, if this is true, then it's probably this and 
they, they elaborate to a place they are not able properly to go because the scripture doesn't tell us anything that it is a high, literally an exalted mountain. And this is a reference to authority. In other words, this gracious revelation concerning Messiah, it comes with authority. It's the fact that it is an exalted mountain, not where this mountain is located. We simply do not know. And because that there's a monastery on Har Tavor, the Mount of Tabor, doesn't mean it took place there. People love to speculate, but we ought not. Simply deal with what the scripture provides the reader. That brings safety into our biblical interpretation of the truth of God. So there they were on this high mountain by themselves. And what took place? Now, verse 2. And he was transformed or transfigured it simply is the greek word where we get the english word metamorphosis it speaks about a change and it's in the passive that he didn't change himself he didn't transfigured himself but someone and obviously it's god the father brought about this change a change with a purpose and that purpose as we're going to see is revelation that we might know the truth of God, and that truth changes us. Once more, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them, and he showed, and this is his face, and his face shined as the sun. And the garments, his garments, became white as light. So pretty powerful descriptions. His face became bright like the sun, and his clothes, his garments, were like white light. And what is this to tell us? Well, once more, when we speak about garments, it speaks about deeds, that his deeds are holy. They're pure, and they give revelation towards his identity secondly his face this also speaks about his presence that he was god among them all of this speaks about him being the only begotten son of god and it is a requirement if we're going to receive salvation if we're going to be empowered by the holy spirit messiah spirit then we need to know the truth have a right, a biblical understanding of his identity. So with this truth comes the anointing to carry out the will of God. So verse, verse three, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah with him speaking. Now think of this, Moses and Elijah suddenly appeared in that same location on that that exalted mountain and they were speaking with him now this is why the context bringing a jewish context to the scripture is so important because many times when you ask someone what does the fact that elijah and moses are mentioned people will again speculate they'll have all types of of answers to that question but there's really only one. If you were to ask someone who's trained in in the, the biblical revelation of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, they would all say to you, Elijah and Moses. Moses represents the law, Elijah, the prophets. And when we talk about the law and the prophets, and we see this in the New Covenant as well, this perspective, it is speaking about the scripture so what we see here with elijah's presence and moses presence we see very clearly that the word of god reveals the identity of messiah this is the takeaway from this passage and what is the proper identity of messiah that the scripture reveals well we'll come to that in a moment
But there, these two men, Moses and Elijah, they were speaking to Yeshua in this location. And now, verse 4, but that means in contrast to, to where the scripture was going, Peter, and again, it's always Peter. Peter answered, he said to Yeshua, Lord, and again, too flippantly, too casually, Peter called Yeshua Lord. And the reason why I say it is because he makes mention of this term Lord, and then he kind of instructs or disagrees or, or has conflict with Messiah himself. If you recognize him as Lord, you are going to submit and agree. You're not going to tell him what to do. You're going to do what he and his word instructs us to do. So Peter, he says to Yeshua, Lord, is it good? Is it proper? Is it well that we are here? Do you want that we should make here three booths? Now, Peter he questions. Remember what happens. You look at verse 1 and verse 2, we read that it was Messiah that, that takes these three men, Peter, Yaakov, or James, and John, alongside of him. And he brings them up to this location for a purpose. So why would Peter say, Lord, is it good that we would be here with you? Messiah brought them to this location. And then secondly, another problem. Instead of waiting for instructions, instead of waiting in silence for the word of God, revelation, what does Peter do? And I can certainly identify with this. Instead of being silent and listening, sometimes some of us, we have a tendency simply to speak and and blurt out things rather than waiting for God's revelation in the right time. So Peter says, do you want that we should make here three booths? For you one, and Moses one, and one for Elijah. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, in treating these three the same way, it's as though Elijah... Moses and Yeshua are all on the same status. This is false. It is only Messiah who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is the only divine son of God. And this whole scripture, the transfiguration, shouts concerning the divinity of Messiah, that he is indeed the son of God. Now, why am I emphasizing that? Well, if you've read this story, you know. Because I want to be a person that agrees with God. And as we keep reading, as, as Peter is saying all of these things, notice what happens, verse 5. Yet he was still speaking, and behold, a, a bright cloud basically overshadowed them, sat upon them, covered them, however you want to translate this, this expression. And behold, a voice from the crowd saying, or from the cloud saying, this one. Now this makes it emphatic. They hear from the cloud a voice. Whose voice do you think this is? Obviously, it's undeniable. There's no other interpretation based upon what we're going to read in a moment. This is the voice of the living God, the God of Israel. And what does he say? And again, it's emphatic. He's emphasizing this. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Him you listen to, you hear. And again, that term him comes, or that term here comes with the context of hearing for the purpose of obedience. Notice, it's not just Elijah, it's not Moses. Obviously, what they said in the scripture is from God. 
But it's Yeshua and only Yeshua who is the only begotten Son of God. And this expression, Him, and this is the order of the original language, Him, you hear, is very similar to what we read in the Torah about God's promise, a messianic promise, to raise up one like Moses from your brethren. And this one, and everyone agrees, this one like Moses, what does it mean like Moses? A redeemer. Moses, in a physical way, redeemed God, used him as the instrument of redemption to bring the people out of Egypt. He was a leader. And in a similar way, but in a greater way, it is Yeshua, who God is going to use to bring us out of this world of sin and into his kingdom. That's why it is incumbent, it is a must that him we listen to. So God, no question it's him. He says, uh, him you hear, verse 6. And the disciples, after hearing this, they fell upon their face and they were fearful. This is in the passive meaning what they, they beheld, what they heard, this experience with this voice from the heaven, this cloud that came. And obviously the cloud is very reminiscent of what we see coming out of, of Egypt, leading the children of Israel in that wilderness for those 40 years. The cloud represents the presence of God. And it was God and God alone who said these words. And that's why, once more, these disciples... They fell upon their face and they were greatly, exceedingly afraid. Verse 7. And Yeshua, he, he came to, and the implication is, came to them and touched them and said, Be risen and do not fear. Now, the language here, when he says, rise up, it is not that they could do it on their own. The, the Greek language, which is so specific, means that he had to help them up. He had to raise them up because, once again, it's in the passive. They were so overcome and overwhelmed by the voice of God, the presence of God, and the power of this event that Messiah had to stand them up. That's what the Word of God is revealing to us, verse, verse 8. And they lifted up their eyes. No one, nothing, no one did they see except Yeshua, that is Jesus, alone. And again, all of this had one purpose. The fact that he was transfigured before them shows his identity. It manifested in a, a visible way the divinity of of Christ and again I want to say over and over if you deny the divinity of Christ if you don't see him as the son of God and worthy to be worshiped God among us the living God with his people if you don't understand him in this way you will not be in the kingdom of God it is vital that you have a right understanding of who the Savior is. He is not just some man, not just some miracle worker, not someone that just rose from the dead, but he is the Son of God. And one of the things we see when we study the Word of God, especially what Paul revealed, is that there is a unique relationship, union, between the, the fact that Yeshua, is fully man and fully God. It is not that he seemed as a man. That is heresy. When the scripture says he came in the likeness of human flesh, it does not mean that he did not come in human flesh. He did. He was fully, truly, absolutely a human being. But he was also fully God. And this wonderful union 
we don't understand it. Our minds cannot uh, put itself around it, but it is factual. And it makes him unique and therefore the only Savior. No one is greater than Yeshua because he is God. And that's what the scripture tells us. So Yeshua, we see that he was left with them alone. Now verse 9. And then, coming down from the mountain, Yeshua commanded them, saying, Nothing you say concerning the vision. And that's what this was. It was a vision of confirmation. This vision confirmed who he is. Not who he became, but who he is from eternity past and eternity future there is never time that yeshua didn't exist and he existed eternally as god a member of that holy trinity god the father god the son and god the holy spirit and let me just simply say if you deny the trinity see one of the truths of the scripture it is very strongly presented that messiah was conceived by the Holy Spirit without any human intervention, without the seed of man. And we know that he was born of a virgin. And this virgin birth speaks of his divinity. So if you don't affirm the virgin birth, if you don't affirm the Trinity, then you are denying the divinity of Messiah and you have not believed, nor do you know, the biblical Savior. And when you do not know the Savior biblically, you are not saved. It is incumbent that we confess him, and that means we know him, his true identity. So coming down from the mountain, he said to them, nothing you say in regard to this vision until which the Son of Man, that is a description and a term for Messiah, until the Son of Man, From the dead, he rises up. Now, the Texas Receptus, this Greek text that I'm using, says just that. Until he rises up. The Nestle Allen Greek text says until he is raised from the dead. These are the type of textual variants that we have in the scripture. Not usually very significant. Just a different word in a different form that is presented. But it still speaks about after he was raised from the dead, then it's important to reveal his identity. The the son of God, the divine son of God, the only one who is divine. With God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse verse. 10 and his disciples asked him saying why therefore do the scribes say that elijah that it's necessary for him to come first and notice yeshua's response now they're basing this on a prophetic passage from the book of malachi in that last chapter so they say why do the scribes and the scribes are the experts of the scripture they are not the ones that copy the text that's the simple understanding of scribes but in this case they're speaking about the ones who gave the laws the the proper way for the scripture to be copied and to do so in order that that letters were were shaped differently they were larger they were smaller there were spaces and all of this represents signs to cause someone to remember the interpretation of this group uh, called the scribes. So they say, therefore, why do the scribes say that Elijah, it's necessary to come first? Verse 11, but Yeshua answered, he said to them, on one hand, Elijah comes first and he will restore all things. We see that again in Malachi. 
but I say to you that Elijah has already come. But Elijah has two purposes. His first purpose is to be the forerunner, to prepare the way. Then before Messiah's second coming, not speaking about the rapture, but his second coming, Elijah will come and restore all things, just like Yeshua said. The passage from Malachi says he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. There will be unity concerning who we're speaking about, Messiah. So he says, I say to you, verse 12, Elijah has already come, but they did not recognize him, but they did unto him what they desired. And we read, thus, look now to the second part of verse 12, thus also the Son of Man is about to suffer by them. So he speaks about how Elijah, but in this case, he's speaking about John the Baptist, who came, as the scripture says, in the spirit of Elijah. He called the people to repentance. He spoke for truth. He stood up for the truth of the commandments of God. And what happened to him? They put him to death. And Messiah says, likewise, because I came with that same message, I'm the one that Elijah pointed to. They're going to bring about, notice what this says in the end of verse 12, thus also the Son of Man is about to suffer by them. Last verse, verse 13. When Yeshua made this connection, between suffering and the one who came in the spirit of Elijah, speaking of John the Baptist, finally, the disciples, they understood. For we read in verse 13, then the disciples understood that concerning John the Baptist, he spoke to them. And what do we learn from this with the reference of John the Baptist? Something so clear, but something so important, and that's this. It is only when we understand the identity of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that he is the only son of God. He is divine. He is the savior that came to bring about eternal redemption for those who believe in him. And through that, that belief is going to produce repentance that bears fruit that is pleasing to God. That's the message of this passage. Well, I'm out of time until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>